Over these past weeks, we've been talking about family matters, and we've been talking about how God blesses the family in so many different ways. But today we're going a little different route. We're going to be talking about being transformed, and within the family, each one of us has a role to play. And that's what we want to talk about as the individual today. Now, I want us to go back to the 19th century. And back in the 19th century, a shift occurred, and they stopped calling people who went on trips travelers, and all of a sudden they became known as tourists. A traveler literally means one who, who travails. He labors and he suffers and he endures to get where he wants to go. And in the process, he emerges himself into a culture. He learns the language and learns the customs and lives with the locals and imitates the dress and eats their food and takes risk and makes sacrifices. And he's gone a long time. And if he returns, he returns altered. A tourist, on the other hand, literally is one who goes in circles. He's just taken a detour home. He's only passing through, he's sampling the wares, acquiring souvenirs. He retreats each night to a nice, safe place, and he returns to where he comes from with lots of photos, a few mementos, and a cheap hat. He's happy to be back, and he declares there's no place like home. Well, we've made a similar shift in the church. At some point, we have... We stopped calling Christians disciples, and we started calling Christians believers. A disciple is one who follows and imitates Jesus. A disciple will lose his life in order to find it. A disciple will be steeped in the language and the culture of Christ until God's very word and world reshapes the disciple's life and the way he lives. A believer, on the other hand, Hold certain beliefs. But how deep do those beliefs really go? And I think it depends on the weather and their mood. They can get defensive about their beliefs, but in their honest moments, they wonder why they haven't made more of a difference. Now, you can't be a disciple without being a believer, but you can be a believer without being a disciple. You can say all the right things, think all the right things, believe all the right things, do all the right things, and still not follow and imitate Christ. The kingdom of God is made up of travelers, but our churches are largely populated with tourists. The kingdom is full of disciples, but our churches are filled with believers. And today I pray that we value life transformation and not information. That we will be disciples and not just believers. And that through our learning, we will lead to be more Christ-like. The word transformation means to change into something different. And implies a major reformation in form, nature, and function. It also suggests something abrupt or startling. We get the word from the Greek word that's now the English word or the scientific word, metamorphosis. It's like when a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. We all learned that back in science, didn't we? But transformation, when it comes to our relationship with God, means we're not satisfied just maintaining the status quo. We're not content to continue year after year with the same ideas and attitudes and habits that we've always had. We believe that God wants to change us, that he has the power to change us, and that he is changing us. Yes, it's true that God accepts us completely just as we are. Oh, thank you, Lord. But it's also true that he's not willing to leave us just as we are. He wants to change us through and through, from top to bottom. He wants to shape and strengthen our character. He wants to clean out the muck that's there in our souls. He wants to rework our values and priorities. He wants to give us wisdom and insight and understanding. What he wants to do is make us more like Jesus Christ. The epistle reading for today 
that last verse, verse 18, it says, And we also who with unveiled faces are all reflect the Lord's glory. We are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. You see, the goal is that we are being transformed into the likeness of Christ. Not that we lose our unique personalities or become little cookie-cutter Christians. That's not at all what God wants. If you're concerned about that, just look at creation. The incredible variety that's there, the thousands of different insects and plants and animals, everything from an ant to panda bears to hammerhead sharks. We serve a God who loves diversity. Oh, thank you for the diversity that we all get to experience. Not a God who wants everything to be the same. But he does want to change us for the better. And that process began on the day of our baptism when we were clothed in Christ. And it will continue throughout our lives until Jesus comes again. Read with me from 2 Corinthians, Corinthians 5. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. In Christ we are new. Paul put it another way in Philippians 1, 6. He says, in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And so transformation is what God intends for every child of God and that we keep learning and that we keep growing and keep changing our whole life. It's a continuing process. It's a journey that will be complete only when Christ returns. And until that time, we are all works in in progress. This is what Paul wrote about himself. He says, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection. Paul, the great preacher, he says, but I keep working toward that day when I will finally be all that Christ Jesus saved me for and wants me to be. No, dear brothers and sisters, I am still not all that I should be, but I am focusing all my energies on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I strain to reach the end of the race and receive the prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us up to heaven. Did you hear the good news within that verse? Our verses. We can be better than we are because this is not as good as it gets. Whatever you are spiritually, if you're a newcomer or you're spiritually mature, you can go farther. You can go deeper with God. And you can see him do greater things in your life than you've seen thus far. God is saying to us today, I'm just getting started. You ain't seen nothing yet. I grew up with Superman, and later came Batman, and they all came from comic books. What are those, some of you are saying? But often in these storylines, the admired-mannered reporter or an eccentric, wealthy young man would go through this transformation in order to become the superhero. Ordinary people suddenly with supernatural power to live extraordinary lives. And we say, oh, that's outrageous. That's a fantasy. But is it? Isn't that what we seek? And isn't that what's portrayed for us each day on television and through the movies? In the series Family Matter, there was this transformation chamber, if you remember it. Steve Urkel, after you poured the blue flu, came out Stefan Arkell. In another episode, though, we see what happens to Aunt Ona from Altona. The the screen is a little different, but I think you'll get the gist. Let's watch. Bye-bye. Oh, thank you, Harriet. Thank you. Ona, why don't you want to talk to him? Look at me. I'm too fat. Oh, don't say that. You're just shy. No, Harriet. I mean, I'm huge. I beep when I back up. (laughs) Una, don't talk.
talk like that. You're pretty. No, I'm not. I'm a big, fat ham hanger and whale. <laughs> I'm not. I have an invention that can make a brand new you. Have you tested it? No. Are you sure it's gonna work? No. <laughs> Is it 100% safe? No. I'll do it. <laughs> Will this doohickey shrink my clothes, too? Oh, yes, indeed, sweetie. Why, it compresses all your molecules and leaves you wrinkle-free. <laughs> now, I hop in the Skinny Express. There it go. All right. Copy, Gipperoni. If only it was that easy, isn't it? But isn't that the kind of transformation we think of, an outward transformation that everybody will notice? Let me put it another way. We got a lot of young people here, but most of the adults in this room are a bit past our physical prime. Sad, but it's true. I'm not even sure I ever had a physical prime. Maybe a couple of weeks back in high school when I went out for football and the coach used me to hold the tackling dummies during practice, all 145 pounds of me soaking wet. That's me. Since then, it's been all downhill. Now I have aches where I never had them before, and my barber wanted to dye my hair the last time I was there. Oh, the hair I used to have. That's all mine, too. And now, this is what I look like today. Yeah, big, big difference. Or just the transformation of being your pastor. This is what I looked like 25 years ago. And that's Rachel. We reenacted it on Friday. The church has even changed. Yes, diet and exercise can help, and drugstores are full of all kinds of pills and potions promising to restore youthfulness and vigor, but they're only delaying the inevitable, aren't they? Now, fortunately, though, how fortunately, though, my mental facil- faculties are still as sharp as ever. Where was I? <laughs> oh, okay. In the realm of what's truly important, eternally important, decline is not inevitable. In fact, it's just the opposite. Look how Paul put it, and let's read it together. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. The changes God wants in our, to make in our lives are good ones. And you know what? We know it, don't we? But in our human nature, we're still apprehensive. There may be things in your life that you readily admit are not as they should be. Perhaps it's a hard attitude of resentment or bitterness towards some person who wounded you. You know it's wrong, but you can't seem to get over it. Or maybe you're experiencing some unhealthy fear or anxiety Or maybe it could be a tendency of anger and rage that you would like to overcome. But 
each one of us could put down a list of at least a dozen things that we would like to change in ourselves. But the problem is that even when we recognize our need for change, we may be reluctant to actually make the change. So what do we do? We must take action because positive change is not automatic. It's not a matter of God doing everything while we're just going along for the ride. Some people think that. Nor is it a matter of us taking matters into our own hands and doing it all by ourselves. No, it's a cooperative effort between us and God. It's a cause and effect. Romans 12 says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The verb here is in the passive. It means that God is doing the action. Yet it's in the form of an imperative, which is a question, meaning you have to do something too. Be transformed. Paul writes in Philippians 2, he says, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Now this this verse just takes the alarms go off in my head and red flashing lights and work and salvation all in the same sentence because that doesn't work because we believe in salvation by grace, not by works. But Paul puts them together. Why? I'm going to try to explain that this morning because this is one thing that's bothered me a long time. What he is not saying is that we earn forgiveness or merit a right standing with God. Those things happen once we believed in Jesus. God does them for us, and he does them to us. Our only part is to accept this free gift called grace. No work involved. We are changed. We are brought to life spiritually. We are made righteous and holy in God's sight because it's not because of any of our works, but it's what Jesus did for us. His sacrifice paid the penalty for our sins. He gave himself as our substitute on that cross. And through the actions of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we now are forgiven. We have eternal life. Nothing else is required from us. However, because the instant we come to faith, we enter into a new phase of salvation, and that's called sanctification. And that's what Paul is referring to in this verse, sanctification, that lifelong process of transformation that God intends for each one of us. And that phrase does involve our work. We have to labor and strive and persevere if we're going to experience positive spiritual change. And while we are exerting our wills and acting, God is working in us through the Holy Spirit to will and to act. It's a cooperative effort, a kind of cause and effect, but we can sabotage it. We can ignore God's call. We can turn a deaf ear to his voice. We have a choice, and we often choose to resist. Why are we so reluctant to even make positive changes? Usually there is some benefit to maintaining the status quo no matter how miserable we are and no matter how desirable the change may be because there was some reason why we went down that road in the first place. Take resentment. It almost always hurts us more than the other person. The bitterness poisons us instead of them. In fact, they probably aren't even aware that we have a grudge against them. So what's the point? Why do we do it? Perhaps because hatred gives us a feeling of strength, and letting go of that hatred would give us a feeling of weakness and helplessness and of being a victim. But usually there is some emotional payoff motivating even our most self-destructive behaviors. Secondly, change also means uncertainty. It means loss. Even good change involves some kind of loss. Getting married means losing the freedoms of singleness. Getting a better job means leaving the friends at your old job. And so anticipating a loss can make us slow to change. Thirdly, a roadblock to change is fear, the fear unknown. We've never traveled this road before. I don't know if I want to take out and take that risk. 
Fourthly, sometimes pride gets in the way. We don't want to admit that we need to change. And fifthly, finally, there's just plain old inertia. We got into a rut, and we are just stuck in that rut. And we don't have enough energy to to get out of that rut. In our gospel lesson for today, Jesus talked about this invalid who had been an invalid for 38 years. And he came up to him and says, do you want to get well? And we say, what a stupid question. Of course he wanted to get well. He'd been crippled for 38 long years, unable to walk, unable to care for himself, to earn a living. And yet it was the only life this man ever knew as an invalid, probably as a beggar. And at least he knew what was expected of him. He had a place in society. He had friends there at the pool. But once he was healed, his world would be completely changed. All the things which others had done for him, he would now have to do for himself. He'd have to leave the pool and his disabled friends and find a job, make a living, build a new life. Many difficulties and uncertainties lay before him. This morning, Jesus is asking us that same question. Do you want to be well? Think about it before you answer it. Think about that one thing in your life that you would most like to change. Then ask yourself, do I really want freedom from that sin? Do I want freedom from this character flaw, this destructive pattern of behavior? Do I want, really want to grow in this area? Your first response might be, yeah, I really do, I really do. But do you really? Because change is going to cost you something, and you need